Hi everyone, and welcome to KIPP DC's Engaging on the Issues event. My name is Christian Jackson, um, Issues Series, Reopening, Reimagining, and Rebuilding KIPP DC. My name is Kristen Jackson, Associate Development Director of External Impact, and excited to be here with all of you today. Our Engaging on the Issues series is really an opportunity to connect with KIPP DC supporters and the chance to highlight um, our updates and issues impacting our students, families, and teachers. KIPP DC's recovery framework plan for this year is really centered around three buckets. How do we reopen, reimagine, and rebuild the network? Today's conversation will really focus around our reopening efforts and really highlight new investments and protocols we have implemented this year. Before we hear from our speakers today, I just want to remind everyone that you are automatically muted and off video. Um, I highly encourage you to put questions in the Q&A box as we will have time for Q&A in just a little bit. So without further ado, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison Fansler, KIPP DC's president, to kick off our conversation. Hi everyone, um, I am Allison Fansler and I'm just noting that photo from before was definitely pre-pandemic. Um, it has been a year um, and change. Um, so it's really great to connect with you all today um, and uh, talk a little bit about how we are um, rebuilding and opening and how we're approaching this work. Um, so we thought our transition in March 2020 to virtual would be was a test. Um, we thought that was really difficult. Um, and I can say, you know, authentically that this return um, has even been more challenging. It is a, um, it is a lift, um, but we are doing it and we are doing it with an extraordinary team of people who um, continue to show up, put them their best selves first, um, put their feet, put their foot forward, bring their best selves to work and, and make it happen. And so we're really grateful for the team. Um, and we thought when we came back, we knew that if we just approached it as business as usual, um, we would miss an opportunity um, and we would miss an opportunity to reimagine how we could rebuild KIPP DC for uh, the future. And so what I want to talk with you about today is a little bit about how we are um, approaching doing that. Our mission, um, we revised our mission um, right before the pandemic started and um, really have been grateful for that because it is grounding us in what's important. Um, our statement is together with families and communities, we create joyful, academically excellent schools that prepare students with the skills and confidence to pursue the paths they choose, college, career, and beyond so they can live fulfilling lives and build a more just world. And that is really uh, grounding us in what is important. Um, our mission remains the same, but our work is different, obviously, and the context is so different from where we are. Um, and so we wanted to share a few highlights about how we've reopened, how we've lived into that mission, but are responding to the context that we're in. So this year, we welcomed more than 7,000 students and 1,400 staff members. Um, our enrollment has grown because we have opened two more schools this year. Um, and uh, have continued to fill out and, and have strong enrollment at all of our campuses. Um, we do have, like many folks in the city, we are seeing enrollment uh, gaps at pre-K three um, and in pre-K four. It's consistent with where we think the rest of the city is um, and we're watching it closely, um, but we do have strong and robust enrollment elsewhere. Um, we've been able to uh, renovate several of our facilities and bring students back into our new facilities um, in joyful, bright, good learning environments. And we've moved our second high school, um, you see in the bottom, KIPP DC Legacy College Preparatory, um, into a, its own campus at the Farabee Hope um, Recreation Center site um, as we finish building out the, the permanent campus there. On the next slide, uh, we've uh, launched a virtual program for students who wanted to remain virtual. We have around 280 students in pre-K three through 12th grade. Those are a mix of students who have medical eligibility or, or also demonstrated success in a virtual environment and, and they are able to enroll there. Um, we've continued to invest in people. Um, we have added positions um, both in our new schools and positions to help us manage through the environment that we're in. Um, and are bringing great people into the organization to help us uh, manage through. We're also training future school leaders in our new principal and residence programs. We've always had a really strong practice of um, developing 
future leaders, but we formalized that into a program that um, we're really excited about. And fall sports are back. Um, the, the KCB Panthers uh, were in the Washington Post this weekend too. Uh, they're back in action. Um, and really uh, there was some great quotes from students around how it felt to be back on the field. And so lastly, you know, Kip, we are committed to making sure that our environment is safe um, as possible from COVID-19. Um, and a few of our campuses have served as a vaccination site um, and, and we will continue to do so and work with the city hand in hand to make sure that we progress in that space as well. So I wanna turn the stage to Donnie Tington who has been uh, leading a lot of our COVID recovery and reopening efforts. Um, he'll talk about our health and safety efforts. Um, and I'm excited for you to meet him. Morning, everyone, or good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Donnie Tinktum. Uh, for been with the organization for about 15 years now, uh, as both a teacher, a principal for about seven years, and in the last year and a half, uh, I've played the role of director of COVID support, really helping our organization think through a lot of the safety protocols procedures that we want to implement at a school level. Um, I'm happy to, like, that I'm able to support this work, and I, and I can say with confidence that this year, our, our really our number one, number one top line prior, priority is to have students and staff back in the building uh, in, as safely as possible. Uh, you'll see on the screen that there's a 10 sort of uh, step layered mitigation approach to how to keep our buildings as safe as possible. We put a huge investment in this year to really strengthen all the procedures we have around COVID safety. I'm super thankful to uh, the staff and families who signed up to opt in uh, into our in-person la programming last year, as it really gave us the opportunity to start working on these uh, 10, this layered approach to COVID safety. Um, all the things that are listed here are things that we have, uh, we had worked and put in place last year and really spent the summer really scaling up uh, as we prepared for a larger in-person programming for all of our students. Uh, You'll see here that there, there are 10 items uh, that, that really fit the 10 categories of our health and safety framework. Um, we made really intentional choices uh, about where to continue to heavily invest in this health and safety framework by not only talking to our families and our staff and students to find out what really was important to them in terms of how to keep our building safe. Uh, you'll see here things like face mask requirements, like that's universal in our buildings, COVID testing, daily COVID checks for students and staff before they enter the building, temperature screening, quarantine protocols, HVAC improvements. This is where we put uh, uh, many, uh, a really huge investment, millions of dollars into our HVAC systems uh, and air purification systems to really keep our buildings as uh, highest air quality that we could have. Um, and invested in additional nursing staff and again, really supporting the COVID vaccination process in our city. Um, this, uh, this has not been easy. I mean, Allison noted for us, like this last year was challenging and this year is even, even more challenging. And I think the, the thing that we're, we have found to be uh, really hard is while we had created great strong procedures last year, scaling those procedures uh, and making sure the organization can support it is uh, and continues to be the, the, the thing that I have my brain on, the pulse on and our ability to be able to support it. Again, I think we've continue to solve that uh, in thoughtful ways. But again, scaling has been one of the biggest challenges that we are, we are encountering. Uh, one of the areas that I feel like we have really stood out uh, and really put a heavy investment in is uh, to our COVID testing. Uh, it is our belief uh, in talking to our staff, our families, and, and, and uh, our personal beliefs uh, is that testing everyone 100% uh, of our students and our staff weekly for COVID is the one of the biggest ways that we can keep everyone safe in our buildings. Um, it is not the standard in our city to test 100% of students and staff, and it certainly has not been easy uh, standing up a program to test 100% of students and staff. But again, that is what we believe is really important. So all KIPP DC staff and students uh, test weekly for COVID-19. Uh, we are doing individual uh, testing for students. Uh, last year, we did a nasal pool testing model where uh, all the kids' samples were tested in, uh, in mass in a classroom. So it was, in, it was a, a pod was tested together. This year, we had pivoted to an individual testing uh, process using saliva. Um, and that's the same vendor that the city has used for testing uh, at DCPS schools this year. 
Um, it's great because the individual testing gives us really immediate uh, individualized data on uh, positive cases so we can do better contact tracing. Um, we also uh, put a huge investment into contact tracing. And so uh, at KIPBC, when we have a positive case, there is a team of KIPBC uh, staff members who immediately start the contact tracing process. Uh, this is honestly one of, the way, one of the areas that I think we have really stood up tall and strong in our ability to keep our building safe is when we have positive cases, we immediately can uh, isolate the student we can contact the family members to make sure that student uh, begins their quarantine. We were able to have the students who need to quarantine based on close contacts quickly quarantine. Uh, and we have the right systems, procedures, tools to make sure that happens quickly. Uh, on a regular basis, when we find out pos about positive cases, our team can fully contact trace and uh, make sure everyone is where they need to be within a couple of hours. Um, that has proved to be really important for us in building confidence with our staff and our families that when we have positive cases, our team can move quickly. But I'll also acknowledge that that is a large challenge for our organization is that, you know, when uh, I find out that we have a positive case at 1030 at night, you still want to feel like you can like, like keep everyone safe by making sure you contact families, contact staff, um, but not everything is able to be happening at that hour. And so, uh, you know, we are figuring out process procedures and, and communication norms that allow us to continue to keep our buildings safe at the same time moving really fast uh, and as fast as we can while we build the infrastructure to support all this. And so again, we're really happy that we're able to test a large percentage of our staff and 100% uh, of staff and students and have the systems to support contact tracing behind that. Also incredibly important, and I think you, you, we've all seen this, is uh, COVID vaccinations. It's other, the other really important tool in supporting us uh, in keeping our buildings safe. Uh, the city and the mayor recently uh, had a strict mandate uh, that she announced that all staff, teachers, uh, and uh, contractors who are in school buildings must be fully vaccinated by November 1st. Um, right now, our staff sits at about 70% have reported that they're fully vaccinated by submitting their vaccination cards. Uh, we do hope that there's many more that are vaccinated and that will get their cards in. Again, uh, November 1st is a deadline for all staff, uh, staff, teachers, and contractors to have that done. The mayor also announced that all student athletes need to be vaccinated by November 1st. So uh, our football team members, uh, other sports, uh, they will have to make sure they're vaccinated by November 1st to be able to continue participating in that. Um, we are seeing growing numbers of middle school and high school students uh, being vaccinated and we're, we've started our tracking system to be able to uh, make sure we keep track of how uh, vaccination status, COVID vaccination status of our students. And again, uh, launching campaigns to really increase awareness about vaccines and making sure people know how to access that. Those are two of the really important things that we have tried to do to, to really get the right information out and, and make sure people know how to access it. All right, um, I know I shared like a lot of information with you all about, about this, uh, about our COVID safety protocols, but I do hope that it's been helpful to hear more about our health and safety protocols to ensure both our school communities are, are both joyful and safe. Uh, we're gonna shift gears a little bit now. Makia Love, uh, my colleague, is gonna highlight some of the academic investments that we've implemented this year. Hi everyone, my name is Makia Love. Like Donnie, I've been with KIPP DC for about 15 years. First as a teacher at Key Academy, vice principal, and I founded Lead Academy, which is our elementary school in Shaw. Now I'm in the DCAO role, which just means that I support school leaders on the elementary band. And we are entering this year knowing that COVID safety comes first and foremost. And we're so thankful to Donnie and his team for blocking and tackling and really working on those systems so that we, my team, the instructional team, also uh, the school leaders and their leadership teams can still have a focus on academics, right? So we are still prioritizing this year as a year that will be full of learning for kids. So one of the things uh, that we were very cognizant of in our professional development for teachers was being sure to avoid this narrative of learning loss. And so we are intentionally not saying that this Students didn't learn anything last year. In fact, they did learn many things. Some of those we can quantify, 
with uh, like looking at our assessments and seeing where students have grown, but also some soft skills like the ability to use technology better or the ability to advocate. Um, one of the highlights has also been strong family school communication. So we're taking all of the good things that came out of virtual schooling for like 16 months and bringing them into this year. The first is this use of technology. We're really thinking about how we leverage that and moving to now have um, what we call two to one ratio. So all students have a Chromebook that remains at school and then they have a like Chromebook that remains at home. And so students can use that Chromebook at home for various reasons. They can access our learning platforms that we already have, like ST Math or iReady. Also, if that child happens to be quarantined, like Donnie spoke about, they can access learning uh, through Zoom School, which is one of those structures that we uh, got really strong in last year. And now we have that to rely on. So if students do miss school because of COVID, it's a real, it's a reality. Um, we're not equating not being in school in person with missing learning. So really thankful to have that technology. It's been such a blessing um, and to a signal to parents to say that learning, learning can still happen. Um, on the next slide, you'll see that we've really thought about our staffing model. Now, as someone who's been a principal, I know that everything happens through staff. So, um, We've used lots of extra funds to just simply hire more teachers. What's great was that we really didn't lose very many teachers. We had a strong attrition rate, which allowed us to focus on hiring. So for instance, in a typical elementary school, each of those, teach, each of those school leaders were able to hire four additional staff members. Now they could use those staff members first and foremost to create smaller sized classrooms. So in another year, a pre-pandemic year, you may have 24 or 25 students in a class. This year, that number could be closer to 19 or 20. We're really thoughtful, as you might've noticed in uh, Donnie's slide, of having some physical distancing. So in our classrooms, they're spaced three feet apart. So the extra staff really allows us to have more homerooms. And it's a great way for teachers to have a smaller classroom to reconnect. Uh, so we're thinking about how do we keep that going in, in future years? Now we also have other staff members that can serve as interventionists. Um, they can serve as accelerators. I'll talk about that in a little bit. And just can also serve in flex roles in the event that a teacher needs to quarantine. We are so thankful to have that extra staff. It really is just one of the most concrete uh, investments that we've made that allows our schools to feel like we can actually thrive and not just survive, right? So you'll see on the slide, some new roles added are um, before accelerators and virtual learning coaches. I wanna talk about that for just a second. Donnie mentioned and Allison mentioned that we have a virtual learning program. So we've hired more teachers there for those students who are just learning virtually and that's their chosen path to be with KIPDC this year. But we also have accelerators at each campus We've got one person who does small group intervention and acceleration, grades three through eight, all day for math, and a similar counterpart who does that all day for literacy. And this is a person who is in addition to the regular school staff. It's really a great model for us to look at where students left last school year and catch them up on specific standards. They're in those uh, groups for about six weeks where progress monitoring, just another really concrete way uh, to meet students where they are. They're still getting all their core classes, but we're finding extra time to pull them. So again, the extra staff, love it. Um, so every staff member who is at KIPP DC, our goal, right, is to have students learn and grow. We're focusing a lot on mastery this year. So if you think about our academic strategy, we know that students experience the pandemic in lots of different ways. And so one of the things that's really important to us is shoring up the skills that they may not have gotten last year. And that's where we have this focus, yes, on growth, but also on mastery. Um, and one of the, the decisions that we made, we actually started this pre-pandemic, um, but are in, enacting it this year, is pre-K three through fourth grade, we have a new foundational reading curriculum. If you think foundational reading, 
how students learn to read. And it's called Really Great Reading. And one of uh, the highlights of our reading data this year was that students needed more support learning things like phonics, decoding, sight words, vocabulary, syllabification. Those skills are also very hard to teach via Zoom. It's very hard to teach a student how to read over the screen. We're so excited to be piloting this, to have an aligned curriculum pre-K three through four to focus on our foundational skills. So that's our, that's our priority there in the literacy world. We also know that when you teach a student to read well, using the techniques of science of reading, the impact is not only in reading, not only in comprehension, but also in their ability to understand all other subjects, math, social studies, science, and just to become critical thinkers, obviously there's transference into writing as well. In math, um, we're focusing a lot, again, on mastery and depth, not just breadth, but really understanding where students are and doing some bridge work, which is teaching into standards, not only for this year, but also from the previous year, because we may not have touched them during virtual. So our math coaches have done like some Svengali moves to really create a scope and sequence, which allows us to go deep um, in specific standards. We also know that there is no catching students up in one year. Um, our goal is to really pick what's strategic for students to learn this year according to the standards and teach it to mastery. And knowing that we will continue with this approach for the next several years. And lastly, uh, I spoke on this a little bit earlier. One thing I really am proud of is our quarantine learning plans. So our teachers became really adept at Zoom school, for lack of a better word, so that when students do quarantine, they are actually able to receive instruction from their teacher via Zoom. And so we used a lot of structures from last year, some platforms like Nearpod or Seesaw, where teachers are actually teaching um, online. So again, being at home does not mean you don't have access to school if a student, of course, is healthy enough to um, access learning during a quarantine. So that's where our focus is now. And I think that's one thing that parents really appreciate is that their students have something meaningful to do during the quarantine. Of course, academics are our niche. It's what we're here for, but we have to take care of the whole child. So we've continued with some of the trauma-informed work um, and equity work that we've started pre-pandemic which means um, our summer PD, we focused a lot on understanding the different ways that the pandemic has affected different students. Our middle schools are uh, implementing an entire positive behavioral intervention system at each school. Many of our elementary schools are also doing that. And we have a really great cohort. Um, it's more related to equity, but um, a cohort of teachers at each school who are learning equitable practices um, to basically be model classrooms for how you're teaching in a culturally relevant and um, linguistically relevant way. So lastly, we've hired more clinical psychologists. We've hired an extra behavioral analyst. Our students overwhelmingly are so happy to be at school, but we know if we don't take care of the whole child and by extension, the family, the work that we do in academics um, is for not. Uh, some of the topics that we're focusing on in those social emotional lessons um, in middle school and elementary school, a lot about positive identity, conflict resolution, emotional um, management, management of your emotions. And I spoke on this earlier. Um, we're focused on closing gaps with our acceleration and our support by, again, a focus on mastering standards. In addition to those accelerators I spoke about for grades three through eight, we also have literacy lab tutors in every elementary school and every early childhood school. Um, and they have a set curriculum that they work with for students in grades K through two, trying to catch students up on foundational literacy skills, um, which is exactly what our accelerators are also working on with those older students. We've seen lots of success when students have targeted daily consistent um, instruction that meets them at their level, lots of growth and opportunities for feedback. So we're super excited about the investments so that we can have these extra staff members in the building uh, committed to giving students more time to uh, um, just practice more at bats on the skills that they need. 
Uh, I spoke a bit about the equitable practices that we're doing earlier. This isn't something that's new this year. It's really just something that we've been working on pre-pandemic that's just become more apparent um, in light of COVID. So I spoke about the, uh, the cohort pilot with Dr. Holly, where we've got one teacher from every school who is learning about equitable practices and piloting in their school so that other people in their school, other teachers can learn from them and we can spread best practices. But we're also working in both math and literacy with cohorts of teachers to revise our curriculum. So we're actually using rubrics uh, by NYU about what does it mean to have a culturally relevant curriculum and using those to assess our, our units and revising them so that they are relevant to our kids and teachers are teaching in a way um, that is culturally relevant and linguistically relevant. Lastly, one of the strands of professional development for our leaders is called Coaching for Equity. Um, and that is just like what it sounds like. Coaching in a, in a way that is highlighting the strengths of whoever you're coaching, but also being really cognizant of what we bring to the table as coaches and as learners and as leaders because of our identity and, and understanding how that shapes um, how we lead and also being really thoughtful about leading in a way that's designing for the margins. How are we meeting the needs of our families who need us the most or for our students who, who may have been at the margins before um, due to inequity? Um, and lastly, uh, I'm just gonna end with after school and summer experiences. I am sitting in a building right now where I can hear like music happening next door. School feels like school. Most of our students are back with us. There are school gardens happening. Now family engagement might look a little different because of COVID. It might mean the family engagement activities are now picnics outside on the lawn as opposed to parents coming in the building. Um, but we've really utilized Zoom to have even, and technology to have more frequent uh, communication with our families, which was a highlight and we wanna keep doing that. And we fully expect like our extracurriculars are back, the high school level and the middle school level, and also at the elementary school level. So we are, we are back. It looks different. It might feel different, but different can be okay. And we're just really thankful for the investments um, so that we can still focus on academics, which is our niche. I'm gonna turn it over for question and answers. Thanks, Mejia. Um, right now, we will have time to do some questions and answers. So attendees, if you have any questions, please feel free to submit them in um, the Q&A box or in the comments chat. Um, so my first question is for Donnie. Um, we received a question around, we make an effort to proactively communicate out to every member of our campus community, staff, families, and partners, as soon as we learn of a positive case. We have some questions in the chat about what it means when it, we share the date the student was last in the building. So can you just highlight and maybe go a little bit more in depth um, about the communication and quarantine protocol for close contacts, siblings, and others at the campus? Yeah, so the, thank you for asking that question. And it's good for, for me to give clarification on that. Uh, when we get a positive case, the first thing we do is we reach out to the family to find out some specific details about that student's positive case. Uh, we might have a positive, uh, be notified about a positive case, but the kid might, may have not been in the building for the last three weeks because they've been quarantining with their family because someone in their family had COVID. And so therefore they had already, uh, already quarantined and, and later, two weeks later, a week later, whatever it might be, uh, they were diagnosed with, with COVID. So it's really important us, for us to know when the student was last in the building so that we can tell parents a, your student was potentially exposed to that student because they were in the building at the same time, or B, they were last in the building long ago and there was no exposure concern for, for our staff students or uh, of that sort. And so that's why that last in the building matters um, because it helps us define and figure out who were potential close contacts based on CDC and DC Health's guidance for us. In terms of just like the communication, uh, this is where our organization has erred on the side of over communicating as much as we can about uh, our positive COVID cases because we want to make sure our, camp our community has the information uh, about what's happening in our building. And so when we have a positive case, like I said, we reach out to the family first to find out the details of that positive case. We'll contact the school teams to figure out like who were the close contacts for that student, which students were, uh, were present, 
which students weren't, which students sit close to that student, what teachers are in and out of that room, really try to find out all the details of who could potentially be a close contact for that, for that positive person. Um, the next thing is we email uh, all the families who are of students who were close contact saying, your student was a close contact uh, of a, a, a potential close contact uh, of, of a positive person. So we give you your quarantine instructions, return to school dates, uh, suggestions on places you can go get COVID tests, et cetera. Um, and so those are specific for the families who need to have their students quarantined. After that, we then also email the entire school campus. So if you have a student who's in that building, you'll get an email later on that day to say, we want to let you know that there was a COVID case in your building, uh, but did not affect your student because your student was not potentially exposed and not a close co contact. And again, that's sort of the, the us trying to be as, uh, as uh, open about what's happening in our buildings as possible. So parents, you might hear about uh, multiple cases that have been in your building throughout the week, but not actually affect your student because your student was in close contact. Thank you for sharing, Donnie. Of course. Allison, um, we received another question um, from Kat. And so um, the question is, how are we really thinking um, around the vaccine mandate will create or exasperate any staff sh shortage we might experience at KIPP DC? Yeah, um, thanks for that, Kat. It's good to uh, know you're in the, in the room. Um, and for those of yeah, so we are very hopeful and, and, and concentrating all of our efforts on uh, reaching the percentage of our staff that is unvaccinated, or we believe is unvaccinated or unreported um, in the moment. And um, I think the thing that is, is great is that we're doing this as a city so that this is something that, um, you know, in we're holding hands and across the DCPS charters, independent, parochial, private, all of the schools, child care, we have a consistent message, consistent approach, and we appreciate the mayor's leadership on this so that um, we as an educational community are uh, walking together. Um, so, you know, I think we probably can expect there are a handful of folks for whom this won't um, work, um, but we expect the large majority of folks to um, uh, follow uh, the leadership of the mayor and the, and the science and get vaccinated. Um, and we are doing a lot to support people there. We are um, tracking it closely and working closely with our principals to make sure they have information around um, how how vaccination progress is going so that we can make sure we have appropriate staff in the buildings. Um, but, you know, our, our teachers love their students and, um, and we fully anticipate that we'll be in, in strong shape um, with a really safe and vaccinated staff. Um, you know, including, uh, we you know, we expect a, a few medical um, exemptions, religious exemptions, and we, we anticipate a few of those, um, but I think we'll be in good shape. Thanks for sharing, Allison. Makia, I have a question for you. Um, someone would love for you to um, just really elaborate a little bit more on how we are evaluating all of our curriculum to make sure it's culturally relevant. Yeah, so there's not a one size fits all, but one um, protocol that we found was from NYU Stern. Um, so they actually have what is called like a curriculum scorecard. And it's a way that at first you can audit your curriculum um, to see if it's equitable along many different categories. One thing that we've done, it's not only about the product. Before we even like evaluate and then start to make shifts, one of the things that we've been really thinking about is like, who needs to be at the table? So I think what I'm most proud of is when we've adopted a new curriculum over the last year, when we've revised curriculum, it's not just me or my team or the literacy team making those decisions. We've opened up uh, the ability to be on those committees to all of our teachers who are interested. And so now we've got perspectives at the leader level, at the instructional level, um, the, coach, the coaches, but also the teacher's perspective. So typically though, just in sum, we use a scorecard to evaluate and then we see where we're weak. And then we start looking and gathering resources to help um, basically make the curriculum more relevant in like specific areas. That could be around like identity. It can be around perspective taking. Um, but we've really relied a lot on Dr. Holly's work um, and some of that work for the NYU, from NYU for the curriculum scorecards. 
and also processes. I just don't, I want to emphasize like how much people being a part of that work sig sends a signal that it's an equitable process. Awesome, thanks for sharing, Makia. Allison, my next question is for you. Um, we have a question from um, Beth who would love to, who asked that through virtual experience over a year and a half since um, March of 2020, how are we, you know, working and supporting our eighth graders who need to find good fit high schools? Um, and also how are we working with our high school seniors who need to, um, are doing research around college and post high school options? So we'd love for you to touch on that yeah. from a kid forward standpoint. Um, I think in large part, because that counseling is so individualized, um, it's been one of the things that we've been able to pivot easily to virtual. It is a um, very individualized experience. And, you know, we have a robust staff around college counselors within our high school and at the Kip Through College team. Um, and young people are um, much more facile <laughs> in this space than uh, those of my generation. Um, so I think that has been, that counseling interaction has been um, relatively consistent. I think we have seen a dip in college matriculation. There have been uh, students who've chosen to pursue other opportunities. Um, We're working to get um, in a very realistic and pragmatic way that, that maybe college would not be the same right now that it would be in other environments. And so they're pursuing other um, opportunities and we're working to get um, students who, for whom we still think college is a really viable and strong option back on that path, if that's the path that they wanna be in. Um, our persistence rates have actually um, stayed steady and potentially increased. Um, I think we're seeing uh, some students who might have uh, stopped out um, really staying in because they're able to, the colleges are meeting um, their flexibility needs. So that's something that we're watching. Um, but this type of student interaction has been, has remained strong. Um, in fact, I remember in the spring, we were doing an interview panel for um, students receiving a scholarship um, and it was actually, there were a lot of benefits to being able to do it in a virtual environment where the student was, uh, we were able to cover a lot more ground. Um, and so a lot of that work pivots nicely virtually, um, but I know folks really wanna get back in with students as well. Awesome, thank you, Allison. Um, if our attendees have any other questions, feel free to submit them um, and I will make sure that our panelists can follow up with you afterwards. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Allison Fanzer to close us out and really talk about QPC's future ambition. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, you know, I have been with QPC, this is my 16th year, and um, it has changed every year, um, but we really uh, put some time and effort into thinking about our future two years ago. And, you know, in the, again, at the time that we did this, this was in um, around January, February of uh, 2019, um, excuse me, 2020, we really did not understand how much the world would change, but a lot of the work that we did is foundational and still helps guide us moving forward. Um, I hear a lot about, um, from folks in this kind of virtual room and from people that I'm connecting with, like, how can we help? How can we help you move forward? And I think a lot of it is the continued cheerleading and support and patience and grace that we've seen demonstrated by our community. Um, even asking reminds us that you're still there and that the connection is strong and that we can find you when we know what it is that we need. Um, we're in a constant, um, constant conversation around understanding what it is that it will take us to move us to the next step. Um, many of you are also in a place of um, understanding that we are, we are the lucky beneficiaries of a lot of federal investments right now. And so we are really working hard to figure out how to maximize a lot of the federal funds that um, have come our way and that we anticipate to continue to come and do those in, in ways that are really impactful in the moment. Um, in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking, how are we gonna sustain this? How are we gonna keep this moving when the federal funds that are here to support recovery um, go away? And so partnership around thinking about sustainability of some of these investments, the talent investments Makia talked about, the, the learning accelerators, the additional teachers, those, have been, those are meaningful. They're meaningful now and they will continue to be meaningful. And so we'll look for partnership from this community there. Um, I think that that, um, that wraps sort of where we are in the moment. Um, Kristen, I can hand it back to you. And I just appreciate folks who have showed up to, again, continue to support us and 
and bring curiosity and affirmation to the work that we're doing. Great. Thanks, Allison. And I just want to extend so much gratitude to our speakers today. So thank you, Makia and Donnie, for also joining us. Um, and I also just want to say thank you to all of our stakeholders um, for attending. Um, we would love for you to stay connected. So please look out for a follow-up email on ways to get involved with KIPP DC and for an RSVP link to our next Engaging on the Issues conversation. So thank you again for joining us, wishing you all a wonderful rest of the day. And I look forward to connecting with you soon.